All right, welcome back to the 25th annual Wallace Stegner Symposium. My name is Robin Craig. I am the James I. Farr Presidential Professor of Law here at the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law, and I'm a member of the Stegner faculty. It is my great pleasure to introduce our noontime speaker, uh, Severine Fleming. Uh, Severine uh, is going to be speaking on our landscape in common, customary rights, and the incoming generation. She is the executive director of Greenhorns, the board chair of Agrarian Trust, and a farmer at Smithereens Farms. She works with young farmers and co-founded the National Young Farmers Coalition, trying to improve their future as farmers and their interaction with society and the environment. So with that as an introduction, I am pleased to welcome Severine Fleming to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure. So it's interesting to be here in this virtual way. Um, so many people in my generation are um, interrupted from their lives of learning and employment. We have fascinating, uh, a fascinating moment to talk about the future of land use and um, the emergence of new customary rights in response to the crises that we face. So I'm first gonna talk about the work that we've done with Agrarian Trust. And then because this is such an interesting time, um, I'm gonna go into some kind of theory um, and proposals for those who are listening, who are lawyers and policy types, who are thinking about the reorganization and reorientation and the reformatting of our social, economic and legal regimes that's going on right now. Um, in order to help inform that process moving forward. Oh, now I don't know how to make my slide go forward. Let's see. Oh, it works. I just click. So um, the first thing to visualize is what are we talking about when we're talking about the incoming generation and the farmland um, that we have to take on? The land um, with the red, that is our federal and public lands, um, which is about the same as the Louisiana Purchase, 400 million acres. Um, that is about how much land is in transition in the next 20 years. So essentially 70% of US farmland is owned by people over 65. And so as a nation, what we're faced with is a massive um, farmland succession moment, an, an inflection in ownership. And the trends of the last 20 years have all been in the direction of consolidation, corporatization, financialization, uh, concentration of ownership as larger and larger operations become the dominant form on, on the landscape. At the same time, we see a counter trend of small farms, medium sized farms, especially focused on highly diverse agroecological operations, especially oriented at customer direct or value added processes. And that's a lot of where the action is when it comes to new farmers. Um, our project with Agrarian Trust has been to match these young farmers that we have been organizing with for the last 15 years um, and the kinds of operations that they run with the land that they need in order to sustain those businesses and sustain the communities in which they live. Um, obviously the young farmers uh, that I'm talking about are powerful agents of change in their own right, entrepreneurs, innovators, agroecologists. Um, they're involving themselves with all aspects of a farm business. Um, here you see my friend Asa unrolling a tarp that he got recycled from the um, it was actually the Marines recruitment poster that they put up on a billboard, but he uses it to shelter his baby piglets. And my friend Grant working on converting an electric tractor um, for his agroforestry farm in Iowa. So there's a serious amount of bootstrapping that's involved in the startup of these small family farms and, and small family businesses. And as we see in this coming time, 
the rural um, small family farms and family businesses and small town businesses are all profoundly imperiled by the disruption in um, the kind of normal economic behavior of this country. But at the same time, the local food infrastructure, the networks, the food hubs, the tight distribution chains that have been built by these local farm sector are actually incredibly resilient and already we see extraordinary first response um, to food production and providing affordable food access um, locally through local means. So, so then, so that's what we're talking about is the land and that's who we're talking about is the youth. And now the question is, what is the project that we're trying to undertake on the land? Um, on your left, you see the conservation tillage that was a practice that was brought about during the response, the national response to the, another great crisis, which was the Dust Bowl. After the Dust Bowl took soil and blew away crops and, and created massive uh, economic disruption and ecological disruption across the, the country, the United States Department of Agriculture got really serious and said, we need to till on the contour and we need to plant um, our crops on the contour of the land to prevent the erosion. Now, it's still not a tremendously uh, progressive agronomic regime. Um, it is better. So you have, instead of you know only corn, you have corn and soy in rotation and you have them in strips. What we're proposing in terms of the next phase of restoration is a far more profound transformation of the uh, planted earth of the of the agri agricultural landscape of the working landscape and you can see on your right an agroforest farm um, in Wisconsin which as you see also deeply reflects the contours um, of the landscape but which is marked by diversity polyculture um, has natural areas going through it has ponds has uh, pastured animals and is a landscape that is dense with possibility and resilience. So that's kind of our, our goal, is what is the way to create the best habitat, legally, socially, economically, for the best kind of farming to occur on the land? And this is, of course, at a time when we have a generation that has, at the moment, $1.3 trillion in educational debt, um, which happens to be about half the value of the land that's, you know, up for transition. So we have true two, more than $2 trillion worth of land at current land prices and a generation that already has more than a trillion dollars in debt. So you'd almost need a double jubilee, everyone get their fees back, plus double, in order to be able to take on that farmland. So the price of farmland I cannot overemphasize is is impossible to afford with a farm with a farm business. People are not able to even if they inherit their land necessarily transition easily um, to the next generation. Let alone buying that land um, for a new operation. So that brought us as a community of young farmers to the project of designing um, an appropriate response to this issue and essentially performing a public. Um, a public enactment of the values and the principles that we would like to see in a farmland access regime. So we did this with wonderful lawyers um, from Oakland who um, their book is on the right hand side. It's called Practicing Law in a Sharing Economy. We consulted lawyers around the country. We looked to history. We looked to France. We talked about um, many things and we documented all the discussions in an open source software platform called GitHub, so that others who were following along this path would be able to trace our steps and um, discover along with us um, how to enact what, what we ended up using were um, a community, well, I have, a next, I have a next slide, kind of an evolution of a uh, conservation easement. A conservation easement, as you are all likely familiar, is there to protect natural areas. Um, a community land trust is often, is a kind of an adaptation. 
and that is often used for affordable housing in the city, um, especially for social housing. And so the agrarian commons is a kind of, it's a locally, it's a community land trust. It's overseen by a national land trust. And so that the local groups are managing the decision-making and overseeing the administration and leases of the farms and the national group supports with technical assistance, marketing, infrastructure, donor, you know, managing the donors. Um, and you have a system that supports the, the people closest to the land making the decisions. And then those who are further away are supporting um, these local, these local entities. And I, this is, a, this is a obviously an overview and an illustration, and I invite any of you who are interested to dig into the details um, of the 501c3, 501c2 process with us. And um, one of our biggest goals with Agrarian Trust is to um, support others in their own attempts to solve the same problem. We, um, we have nine pieces of land uh, onboarding into the trust at the, at the moment, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of farms um, that need to succeed in their succession. So just to say, this is a long um, study um, of land commoning and holding land in community ownership and in community governance. And that, um, you know, for those of you who are kind of interested to break apart some of the kind of, uh, private family farm real estate framework will find many crystals with which to um, to peer into and to discover um, other approaches and other perspectives on how land can be held. Um, so just to name a few, um, Terre en Vue and Terre de Lien are European projects um, which have now hundreds of farms held by community trusts that are leased on a lifetime basis to farmers with constraints uh, on them that say only organic farming, only farming for the local area. Um, there's a long lineage to this work. Um, Slater King, who's in the lower right-hand corner, he was a part of the first community land trust um, in a rural area. And that was in, in, the, in the rural South in Georgia. And it was the sharecroppers who were all, finally able to become cooperative owners of what had been a plantation. And again, these were, these were arrangements and new legal forms that arose in the context of repairing um, the injustices of the past and trying to make a, a kind of a workable way forward. And again, rearranging um, our relationships legally, socially, and economically in order to do what's best for the land and for community nutrition. So I would say, um, study your, if you're interested in this kind of space. Um, Agrarian Trust has an active blog with land thinking and land news um, and the work of um, Tolstoy and Henry George and Mary King and Eleanor Ostrom, who are all great thinkers who understand that the way we hold and govern and administrate and care for our land um, underlies um, so much of what can arise in our society. So in order to, uh, what do they say? In order to make an apple pie, first you have to create the universe. So the first farm, very practically speaking, that we have to bring into the trust, well, actually we've already brought one farm into the trust on Whidbey Island in Washington state. Um, that's the 13 acre site. Um, the second property is called Windy Acres Farm. Um, and it's a typical um, story in terms of being uh, septuagenarian owners who are incredibly passionate, incredibly motivated for uh, farm stewardship and really keen to move their farm forward to the next generation. Um, these guys are growing organic grains and they're the only organic grain farmers in, in their area um, and they want to pass it forward. So in this case, what we have negotiated is a bargain sale with the owners. Unfortunately, the man who's in the video that you can watch on our website has passed away, um, but the agreement is in place and the plan moves forward to pass this farm to the already identified farmers who've been working with the elders who aren't their family, but who have been working with the elders running operations for a number of years 
and who are ready to take on the lease from agrarian trust who would then hold title to the land. So now moving from that kind of concrete example of what we've been up to with agrarian trust and um, the nine different properties that I alluded to each have their own page on the Agrarian Trust website with kind of a profile of the farm, the incoming farmers, the outgoing farmers, the community of support that's around them, kind of a characterization of how that farm fits into the broader um, local food ecosystem. And obviously all of that work needs funding and needs support, but also needs to be uh, studied um, because we're hoping that others will attempt and approach this problem as well. Um, because the scale of the issue is so great. But now I wanted to move into kind of a more theoretical and philosophical discussion of how, especially in this time of crisis, we're thinking more boldly about the reconfiguration um, of our social institutions and our economic forms to, to respond to this unfolding climate crisis and, of course, health crisis. And if the, you know, the level of engagement and response that we could enact to build local food resilience and to re-diversify the use of our landscape and to repair the ecological degradation that we see um, on, our, of our, on our lands uh, in the same way that we're approaching the you know, preservation of human life, uh, well, that would be the scale of response that's needed. So here is a wonderful case study in Paris. It's an old hospital, as you can see, um, that takes over a whole city block in Paris. And essentially the, the city of Paris could no longer run this hospital and it was sitting empty. And a design collective that was formed in an even a poorer city um, or a wilder city, Marseille, they made a pitch and proposed to the city of Paris to become tenants and to do a kind of adaptive reuse of this hospital. And so what they installed in this basically dead hospital, you know, you can think of an, ag an analog in the agricultural world of all the underutilized land and vacant barns and monocultures that are degraded. And now hundreds of entrepreneurs are clustered in this hospital. They are running a cafe. They are building, they have architectural, um, uh, they have architectural installations and competitions to create different kind of environments within the hospital. They have a brewery, they have a bakery, they have a urban reuse center, they do compost, they do vermiculture, they do a clothing uh, repair, they sell, um, I said building equipment, but that's one of their biggest revenue generators is recycling building uh, supplies for people to do home renovations. They have housing for migrants. They have housing for refugees. They have a childcare. They have a whole set of social enterprises. Um, they have a bakery all inside of this hospital, which has now become a hub for social engagement and um, restoration. So another interesting example to look at um, as we're thinking about kind of analog examples of the revitalization that is needed. In the US, we have this great degraded, uh, tilled up center. <laughs> we have extraordinary amount of our land in monoculture. And I just want to point to an amazing place in the world where informal tenure of trees um, persists a thousand kilometers long. This is the diagram that shows the Sahel uh, shea butter agroforest parkland. So this is a agroforest land, it's tilled, there's farming that goes on underneath, but it is essentially a contiguous forest of trees, the care of which, the tending of which, and the income of which is managed by women who have informal, i.e. customary rights to those trees and who harvest the fruit and who process the nuts and who are woefully underpaid for their extraordinary effort, but meaningfully contribute to household income and uh, nutritional security of their communities by managing this forest, this agro agroforest on their lands. So what am I alluding to? I'm, I'm alluding to different forms of tenure that are not ownership, but that are matching the needs of the users and which describe a the kind of highest social calling of the land. 
one of our big questions often is, what does the land want? And how are we arranging ourselves, our, our human selves, to um, match our efforts to the highest use of this land? So this is the place we find ourselves in now in this kind of crisis of extraction as young people you know, being asked to interrupt our education, being cast out of employment, you know, seeing an extraordinary recession, immer you know, on the horizon, you know, to protect our old, our older population and to protect those who own, you know, who own the capital. And so for young people, it's, uh, it can be demoralizing if you don't have a kind of some framework for how to um, regrow and rebuild. And so that's kind of the challenge of our time is helping to formulate a path forward for those who are interested to move from a place of deforestation and back into a system of regeneration, restoration. Um, then, and again, we have a precedent. How do we empower the tenders of the land, the people who are tending the land? So, um, so this is kind of the, this is kind of the, um, these are the kind of protagonists of our landscape. We have the young people of the CCC who during the great uh, New Deal explosion of civic involvement in land restoration went out and planted 2.3 billion trees. Young men fed three square meals a day, provided real employment and real money to be out building roads, infrastructure, bridges, trails, national park, parklands, and who were engaged in really restoring um, a you know, massive afforestation efforts, um, not only our public lands, but also our private lands. And then you have these women who are tending um, the agroforest in Sahel. So these days we have very powerful tools at our fingertips um, for looking and mapping and being strategic in the way that we plan and enact restoration. So as every city um, and city planner and urban forester and um, even the regional planners have been thinking a lot, where are the areas of strategic importance to protect farmland? Where are the areas for, that we need to protect our wetlands? Where are the areas where we can um, improve our buffering to flooding events? These are layers that are known. These are, these are discoverable um, quantifiers that we can look to as we determine places to, in my, in my proposal, assign tenure to those who will do the care. So where trees are needed, let those who plant the trees have security and tenure of the trees. Um, so these kind of overlaying matrices, um, as we tune into the kind of logic of the landscape, you know, here we're looking at um, the landscape of the petroleum economy overlaid onto a pre-existing palm tree. Um, but, you know, on the right, you see the um, fish ponds and the important agricultural areas that were laid out um, in early Hawaii, you know, that these are places of the, the natural geography gives us signs and gives us clues, you know, that, that it was discovered by indigenous land managers and is rediscoverable by contemporary land managers. Where are the pot most potent places for restoration and recovery? So you can imagine all sorts of ways um, to think about this. Um, but the basic and underlying point is, can we assign special um, qualification to these places where, which are so tremendously important to be restored to those who would do the restoring? So if that means a, a designation of biodiversity, if it means a designation um, for highly erodible lands, um, it means essentially facilitating access to these places which are most potent um, for the benefit of our kind of larger ecological infrastructure uh, to those who would do the work. So one thing that we can say from our experience with Agrarian Trust and with our experiences of CSAs and the local food movement and all of these constituencies who are kind of binding together to support um, alternative land use and an alternative farm economy, even despite the fact that the larger food policy environment is inhospitable to uh, much of what we hold dear within the organic and regenerative farming movement, is that there are these extraordinary locally bound 
communities who really care and who are willing to pay more and willing to go to an alternative distribution site and willing to you know pay for their vegetables at the beginning of the season and commit to getting them every week and so um, you already have um, an established framework for kind of new social forms to emerge. Oh, I had another nice example of a biodiversity commons, uh, but in uh, the lot, well, I'll just tell you, the largest, uh, the largest collection of oak trees in the world in terms of a biodiversity collection isn't held by a seed bank, isn't held by uh, a national botanic garden, isn't held by the FAO. It's actually uh, held on the, the municipally owned land of Aiken, South Carolina, where a passionate collector of oaks over 20 years of work gathered and planted out um, these magnificent oak species from all over the world on public land. And, um, you know, I think it's easy to start when you start talking about the commons it's it's often an immediate response that private property uh interest or private property the habit of thinking in terms of private property will reply and say oh dear you're talking about my land or that that involves a taking but i think it's very important to see that there are many many kinds of land civic held lands already that are perfectly um, good places to start this work so i just made a short list Churches, college campuses, community centers, schools, historical societies, museums, state parks, and archaeological sites, the Trust for Public Land, um, recreational and conservation properties, historic sites. Uh, we've seen extraordinary um, success of young people working in partnership with nonprofits and nonprofits that are called churches in kind of activating that land portfolio for the social mission of the institution. And there's many, many more institutions that have a social mission either in the arts or in education or in some other realm, but whose land use uh, doesn't really match that social mission. You know, maybe they just mow it all and they, or they weed whip it all. And so there's incredibly strategic interventions that could be applied to those contexts. So, So the kind of overall point is if we make the habitat that allows for these best farms to occur, then they will come. And it's really the project of our time to gather and bundle the investment, the infrastructure, the, the forms to enable this access. So, you know, here you have a plantation of, of pineapples on the right obviously an inappropriate land use, obviously kind of a totalizing force over the entire um, landscape, you know, with the tools that we have today, we can see which are the prime agricultural lands, which are the important watersheds to protect, where should we be reinstalling trees onto this landscape? What are the most strategic pockets for us to be working with? And of course, that means investing in uh, the brains and bodies and businesses of the people who are going to do that work, um, and making sure that they have security. And just to say, we have precedent for this. We have successful programs within the Farm Bill, and I'm sure that our Farm Bill people will um, be happy to report that there's incredible um, history in the United States of supporting conservation practices of private property owners on their farmlands. Um, and we were happy to present as well at the most recent um, agroforestry conference a paper about is called multi-party agroforestry, which documents how kind of overlapping enterprises can occur. So here you see a riparian pathway through a agricultural landscape, and you can see the efforts at conservation tillage. You can see the efforts at um, permanent pasture next to the land instead of crops. You can see that there's trees that have been left along the riverway, and so you have you know, basically a crop farmer doing their thing, but you can imagine multiple layers of tenure that occur on top of that. So who is benefiting and who is the beneficiary when we're able to articulate new ways of working together and including more kind of businesses and enterprise layers on the land, um, there's incredible benefits. Another um, program of the Farm Bill is the um, Prairie Strips program, which is basically just letting 
there be natural strips on contour um, in our prairie ecosystems, providing habitat for all the species of insects and birds and um, furry creatures who, you know, previously lived on the prairie and who can still persist in these um, habitat fragments. And so it's this kind of thinking that we need to be applying um, to our landscape. So here is um, an old map of Hawaii again. The Hawaiian land was divided by watershed. The Ahapuaha system was a one contiguous watershed that became its own governance area, which makes a lot of sense if you're trying to administer a, 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 a portion of land to be doing it according to the logic of the watershed. So one thing that that helps us remember is that we can, we can anticipate where will be the places of most profound impact and instead of ha allowing those lands to be overgrown with invasive species and overgrazed and undermanaged and you know in the case of the gullies of Hawaii you know full of trash and runoff and uh, you know invading uh, koki frogs and just you know a cause of siltation into the into the water into the coastal systems that those are actually the places to deal with first and to assign the role of restoration to people who are then in exchange granted tenure over that. So just like the women um, in the Sahel who have rights to the trees that they manage and maintain and protect and protect from the men and their families who might wanna cut them down to, to expand their fields. And just as you provided to the young men of the CCC three square meals a day, they sent their money all home to their families and they were learning vocational skills and they were being, they got literacy training and they you know, built a strong social network and a strong family in the restoration of their, of these landscapes, that you have meaningful employment, security um, and economic incentive to invest in these lands that so profoundly need our investment. So that just kind of, that is basically the end, but I think the kind of overall point is that the challenge I see for the legal, you know, this kind of legal and food farm food land policy world is how are we thinking more radically about the work of restoration and how to enable it? Because it's not uh, drone work and it's not um, AI work and it's not corporate ag work. It's actually a lot of it hand work. It's the work of making terraces, planting trees, establishing contours, establishing mulch, you know, it's really a work that requires a strong amount of, of competence and, you know, a lot of investment in the early stages in order to be able to get a yield. So how do we think about nature's laws and this kind of social mission of these, this kind of public ecological infrastructure and bring to bear the security that the young people will need in order to do this work? So in the kind of settler conventions in the, you know, the Homestead Act was based on the idea that, yes, if you were out on the frontier and braving the, you know, the indigenous and you were there improving the wilderness and um, cultivating the wilderness, that that improvement granted you the right to tenure. So here we are in a different frontier where we have extreme erosion, incredible flooding events, you know, wildly fluctuating planting seasons for our agricultural uh, regions and we have a desperate need to enact restorative practices on these landscapes. So how do we again grant tenure to those who are willing to fit themselves into this landscape strategically um, and, and perform these duties um, of what the land wants. So anyway, I will leave it there and I look forward to uh, conversation and uh, discussion. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you, Severine. That was wonderful. Uh, so many questions, and I, I don't want to use up all of our time. Uh, but uh, just a couple of thoughts as you were going through that. Back to the beginning of your presentation, uh, that's an astounding number that 70% of our agricultural land is being held by people who are age 65 or older. Uh, in your experience, how many of those current owners want to see their family farms turned into uh, one of these new progressive models? 
uh, with younger stewards as opposed to selling them to the corpora uh, corporations and the agribusinesses? Well, I, uh, unfortunately, there's been massive defunding of the uh, USDA Economic, Serv uh, Economic um, Statistics Service. So, you know, getting really good data on farmland ownership and trends is harder these days than ever. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of it is, this, is, is people trapped inside of a macroeconomic context, you know, that you have a lot of guys in their 70s running 5,000 acres of soybeans and milo, you know, or, or um, corn with Roundup, with, you know, the subsidy structures that we have, with the crop insurance programs that we have. And there's, you know, it's, it's basically, it's so big, it's terrifying to, to, to think outside of that system. And, you know, and unfortunately, the system that that set of incentives are, those are perverse incentives. So, you know, if you're locked into a program where you're planting, for instance, cotton, and there's a drought, and uh, the cotton's not going to grow, and you won't get your payment unless you enact the, the, um, the planting. So even if you know it's going to fail, you've got to plant it in order to not go uh, bankrupt. So as far as like a learning landscape or having a feedback loop about how the climate is changing, you know, your land is flooded, you can't plant it, you know, it's, it's you know, your land is dusty, nothing will grow. Like if, you're, if you have to plant in order to get the payments from the feds, then um, there's a strong disincentive to look at, you know, well, what would be three other different options that I could look at? Or should I be investing more in hedgerows? Or should I be doing an intensive fallow period? And, you know, could... You know, could I be doing intense investment in soil health and um, with a bio, you know highly diverse uh, green manure crop and da da da? So you have a, a kind of a it's big, it's stressful, it's high risk, it's high debt, and so you have a, a practitioner base who really um, don't have much leverage to be doing kind of experimentation. So you know, but what we know about young people is they're wild and bold, and they are. <laughs> you know, especially on a small scale, able to, you know, do more of that experimentation and discover um, new options. And, and because, you know, by hook or by crook, to get a little bit of land to start on, it's often more marginal, you know, in the corners and the edges, the less, you know, um, desirable land. And so you have a kind of a higher touch and um, uh, kind of an uh, uh, approach. And so you'll see what, you know, is often the story of these smaller farms if they, they'll start in a kind of a corner and they're getting going and all, you know, they're able to capitalize and they're able to succeed and prove their worth. And they have a, first a small herd that's working, you know, in the margins and suddenly they're getting enough momentum to be able to graze. And for instance, graze their, their sheep or their beef cows out on the pasture lands of other people, for instance, potato farmers who are going to grow a, a, a rotation of barley, well, then the cows can come out after the barley, clean up the barley, get fed a bunch of hay, and bring their urine and manure onto these crop fields that haven't seen animal manure, you know, in years because <laughs> of the way that we, you know, have so segmented and, and, and specialized our, our agronomic systems. And so that's the kind of dynamism that we need to be increasing and like inciting intergenerational and interoperational uh, collaboration and these benefits that can really be shared, not just on land that, you know, the young person owns or the, or the middle-aged person owns or the old person owns, you know, but be really thinking in these uh, more watershed terms. Great, great. Well, that, that uh, brings up another point too, this slow growth. I mean, obviously this is a long-term investment in a lot of situations that you're not just going to go out tomorrow and next year have this you know perfectly working organic farm that does everything you want it to do and uh, i understand that's why you're interested in getting tenure for people uh, but that's also a reason i would think why it's important that it's younger people that are getting involved in this not only are they more experimental but they can hold out for the long term, uh, for lack of a better way to put that. Do you see that mentality in the, the Greenhorns and the other young farmers you work with? Or are they in it for the long haul? 
Oh yeah. I mean, once you're in, you're in, you know, once you spend, you know, your life in, in a relationship with a living ecology, it's hard to go back to office work. You know, there's, um, there's, it's an incredibly hopeful, um, place to be, especially in these times where, you know, we look around and there is so much, you know, extinction crisis and, um, well, anyway, being a part of something that's generative, that's gaining in complexity, that's attracting more birds every year, that's building more community every year, you know, where the soil is actually improving under your eyes. It's a very compelling work. The, um, you know, the challenge, of course, is to be able to get through that first, you know, 10 year startup phase and have enough viability to be able to raise a family and face the economic realities of, you know, life in America with healthcare costs where they are and, um, and all the rest of it. And so, you know, at the moment, you really have to be kind of a ninja to make it through, you know, or like a slalom skier to make it through, you know, small business startup. And so we really have to make it a lot easier. And I think if we're thinking right now in terms of all these young people who are, you know, in their first job doing service work or informal economy or driving a lift, or working in a restaurant or flipping burgers or doing housekeeping or all the are exactly the sectors of our economy most hit by this corona layoff and um, contraction. So you have an extraordinary amount of young people who need work. And if we were a, we, if we the citizens of the United States and we the policy uh, creators were able to put programs in place that would support employment on farms for people to be trained and do the work and learn what the work is, this would be incredibly strategic. You know, if we're, um, if we're, ser if we're serious about the amount of land that we have to restore, the, 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 the time is now for training the people to do that work. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, that, that brings me to another question. I think you just made it explicit, but I'll give you an opportunity to elaborate. Mm -hmm. uh, when you brought up the analogy to the CCC uh, during the Great Depression, that was quite obviously a federal government funded program. Is, is, is that literally a model you would like to see enacted? Is more federal and maybe state governments uh, support for these programs? Well, and so much of the, you know, so much of the farm economy is defined by the federal level, you know, at the farm bill. I mean, when we had the beginning farmer and rancher development program, that's $27 million a year. That That's a USDA um, that's funded by the farm bill, administered through the federal department of agri, you know, the USDA. And then it goes out um, to all the organizations who are educating young farmers, providing credit to young farmers, you know, doing grants for greenhouses, you know, supporting people with business development and skills building. I mean, yeah, a lot of the way that this country administrates funding comes from a federal uh, place. However, um, you know, we're probably going to see, as we have seen with urban forestry efforts and with climate response efforts, um, that cities and and states and you know even counties are are innovators in this in this way and you know there's plenty of great examples that we have been documenting on the agrarian trust website and that we champion and you know I have whatever eight years of podcasts with greenhorns and we have you know 13 years of blog posts describing all the kind of phenomenology of this movement on the ground and people who are looking about okay, well, now is the time when I can get involved as an advocate, as a lobbyist, as a kind of a company, a, a com to accompany this work in my, in my community. And I think as everybody lines up at Costco to get their toilet paper, you know, figuring out a way to engage actively in building resilience in your own place, in your own watershed, in your own town, and really digging into the civic work that it takes to um, drive change may be something people want to focus on right now. I think, I think there may be a new motivated crew of people showing up to, to do this work. So even on a county level, you know, they're designating our most important ag lands, assigning money to support, you know, new farmers. I mean, even something as simple as what we, what we have been lobbying for for a long time with the Young Farmers Coalition has been student loan forgiveness. You know, if people... 
um, young people coming out of college have to spend, you know, between 10, you know, five and eight or 18 years paying off their student loans, that forces a certain, you know, path for them, you know, and so if you were saying instead, you can do AmeriCorps, you can do farm corps, you can get trained, you can be a rural nurse, you could be a farmer, and your student loan will be forgiven, my God, you know, you're going to get a lot of people. <laughs> So I think um, there's, I, ha I had another piece of paper over there that I wrote more ideas on, but I, I think it's a very powerful time for um, innovative policies that are getting to the root of how do we move the bodies and brains and businesses of our youth into the work that we as a nation need to have done. Uh, that's uh, very encouraging, a, a very optimistic view. Um, the other thing I thought was really uh, an important reminder in what you brought up was the fact that, uh, you know, you say public lands to those of us in the West, and we think the big BLM and uh, national parks and, uh, you know, that scale, but to remind us that things like churches and city parks are also public lands where some of this work could take place, I think is a very important uh, um, and perhaps easier way to get into some of this. So uh, I was just wondering if you had a, uh, a, a particular success story with a, a church or uh, a city park besides the wonderful oak story you told. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and maybe if it had spillover effects too, because that's obviously something you'd be hoping for. Well, so wonderful question. Um, there's actually a great resource if people are church people and they're connected to churches and they didn't realize necessarily that they're also connected to a land portfolio that, you know, we could activate that land portfolio for God, for God's work, you know, for, for producing biodiversity, for producing nourishing food. You know, um, a lot of churches, what's great is that they, um, are often connected to service work and to soup kitchens. And so when it may be a smaller acreage than, you know, a BLM lease, um, lease and, you know, the improvement of, of grazing lands obviously does have a big carbon impact. However, on a small acreage with a lot of care and love, you can grow a lot of food and with a lot of hands. And you can, you know, plant a lot of different species that provides many benefits um, to your your local creatures you know you can create really intensive habitat um, when you're in a kind of a civic land use context so a wonderful example and i actually made a movie about it um, and it's called our land in common and it's uh, on the ourland.tv page of our website and that's the story of a benedictine monastery in iowa in dubuque they're called the cincinnati mound They've been there for a long time. You know, it was, it was a, it's named after this mound, which was a, a, a mine. And so it was first the mine was controlled by the Indians, then the mine was controlled by the miners. Then there was, you know, vice and, and you know, troubles as a result of this kind of extractive economy. So then the nuns came in to, you know, educate and soothe and heal the sick and, you know, provide um, service to this place. and those nuns own that land, not as a family, but as a commons. They own it together. And they're, um, so they're different behaviors from a family farm. They're, um, they're able to think really long term. They're able to be really cooperative and principled about it. And they're able to, you know, administrate a lot more than somebody who's running a household and three kids and a small business and a town and job to be able to afford, you know, health, health and care. So you have a a density of humans and human minds that's also really helpful if you're trying to have many leases on your land to many different um, young farmers or agroforesters or orchardists or someone doing vegetables or someone doing greenhouses or someone making hay or someone making raising beef cows and someone keeping bees you know you start to understand that you can elaborate again a greater density of land use when you have more brains and more bodies and more businesses and more biodiversity on the land. So you're, you're actually just able to do more. <laughs> anyway, so these um, Cincinnati uh, nuns are part of a larger movement 
um, which has a facilitator now. Um, it's called Faithlands. And Agrarian Trust was actually one of the partner organizations for kind of building this network, national network of faith-based organizations who have land and who want to see that land brought into service. And you want to just figure out the basic logistics. How do I write a lease? What kind of insurance? What kind of barn? What kind of public access? You know, how, how um, religious do we need our farmers to be? You know, it's very <laughs> practical questions, but it's basically a parallel case study to the to the land trust movement you know they don't pay taxes on that land they're able to receive gifts of land and then hold it you know they don't have to keep making money in order to be able to pay taxes they can just hold it so if and as churches get good at being good shepherds on that land and inviting in you know the kind of um those of us who are in the next generation who don't maybe sing the songs, but who are singing the songs with our life, you know, who are religious in spirit and who are acting out of, um, well, obviously not responding to market signals, let's say, <laughs> you know, young people who are passionate to grow uh, food and be of service, you know, I feel like there's tremendous kinship that can, that can build there. Even if we not, you know, even if not all of us are, you know, as church going um, as the previous generation was. So, um, yeah, I would say look left, look right. And if you study the town where you live, you will likely discover a tremendous amount of land that could have a public orchard, that could have a community garden, that could have a butterfly sanctuary, that could have beehives on it. You know, if you, if you start to look opportunistically at the place where you live um, and if you think in terms of collaborating between generations and skill sets of how you know how do we respond here where, where we are I think that's again this is the part this is what I'm seeing in my community bubbling up right now you know like I've been getting phone calls all week of people starting soup kitchens you know restaurants close well we have no market to sell our vegetables but we've got a lot of spring vegetables you know in the farm world right now so let's, and the kids are out of school, so they're not getting their lunches and the chefs are out of work because their restaurants are closed. Well, let's reshuffle it, you know, sign up the church to grow the, you know, bring the food in, cook it, put it in a box, distribute it. You know, this isn't rocket science. This is just a reconfiguration of skills to meet a current need. And this is, you know, this is not what big corporations and emergency programs and CDC, you know, this is, this is community response. And I think we, we have a great opportunity to observe the, ph the phenomenology of community response and build relationships in this crisis and see, oh yeah, we can do this if we have good team spirit and we're nimble, you know, and we're quick and we have to do it. We actually really have to do it. No other way. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta happen. It's gotta happen. Well, on that very positive message, uh, in a very uh, anxiety-causing week for a lot of us, I want to thank you, Severine Fleming, for your presentation on uh, changes in farming and new ways to go and the younger generation that's coming up to take over. So thank you very much for joining us. One last thank thing. You. One last thing. Um, if you know young people in your life, help them discover the extraordinary resources of getting into agriculture that we have compiled um, on our website. We have guidebooks, we have podcasts, we have movies, we have a literary journal, you know, we are endlessly trying to find new ways to help young people orient themselves and get on the professional bandwagon. So encourage those young people in your life, if you see them, to think about getting involved in agriculture. All right, will do. Okay. Thank you so much, Severine. Thank you.